Hello everyone and welcome to the theory and key principles of gas chromatography. This is part of a series of lectures on GC designed to teach the various concepts involved in the technique. This lecture is the first in the series and will give you an introduction to gas chromatography. My name is Andrew Clissold and I'll be your presenter today. I'm the GC product manager for Shimadzu in the UK. To give you an overview of the series, we'll be starting with an introduction to the base concept of GC. We will then do separate sessions on specifically columns within GC, the split splitless inlet used in gas chromatography. We're also going to look at some advanced techniques and alternative forms of injection. So not just injecting liquid, but headspace and solid samples as well. We'll do a dedicated lecture on the detectors used in GC one for the processing of the data within GC, and finally a maintenance and troubleshooting section for GC operators. We will be looking at doing a follow-on series where we will teach the basic principles of GC mass spec. So in this presentation, I'll start with a general introduction to give you an overview of the people you'll be hearing from over the course of this series of presentations. I'm gonna go through the base principles of gas chromatography, what it's used for in the modern world. We'll look at the hardware overview to see what physically you'd be dealing with if you were operating a GC. And then we will focus on carrier gas and how that affects how a GC operates. So before we move on to the technical part of this presentation, I'd like to give you an overview of the people you'll be hearing from in the coming weeks and the company we all work for. As well as myself, Andrew Clissold, you'll be hearing from two other presenters. These are Ollie Stacey and Nina Smith. These guys are both technical specialists with many years experience in GC and GCMS. Collectively, we form part of the GC technical team at Shimadzu UK, a company that you may or may not have heard of. We're a very old company, founded in 1875 by Genzo Shimadzu, that's him on the right. We're still based in Japan today, and our central office is in Kyoto. Shimadzu is not just in Japan, however, we have a European head office, which has been going 50 years. Shimadzu has been working in the UK for over 20, and in 2006 we opened a dedicated UK office. We also have a research facility in Manchester. This site helped with our development of mass spectrometry as well as various software packages. We do a variety of analytical equipment. Obviously the content of these lectures will be GC and GCMS, but we also do HPLC, LCMS, FTIR, UV Viz, and various ICP. Outside of the regular analytical equipment you'd find in the laboratory, we do various other divisions of equipment as well. We've been responsible for developing some high-speed cameras, balancers. We have a area dedicated to testing machines, looking at tensile strength. We also have a separate division dedicated to aircraft equipment, medical devices, and some industrial equipment as well. Moving on to the start of the technical content for this lecture, I'm going to start by asking the most important question, what is chromatography? If you were to look this up in a textbook, chromatography is defined as the relative separation of substances based on their affinity to a mobile and stationary phase. Now, if that sounds like gobbledygook, don't worry about it. It did to me when I first started looking at this. Chromatography in layman's terms is about separating a mixture of substances. If you look at any of the chemicals in the modern world, whether it be pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, food, cleaning products, these are all mixtures of chemicals. And in order to analyze them, we need to separate them out so we can look at each one individually. And that's what chromatography is. It's about separating chemicals out. And we do this using two phases, what we call a mobile and a stationary phase. And all you need to remember is that as the name suggests, the mobile phase moves and the stationary phase doesn't. Now in the example we're gonna show you here, this is a very simple form of chromatography called paper chromatography. Essentially, we take a piece of paper and we stand it end up in a glass tank with a very shallow amount of fluid at the bottom. The stationary phase is the paper, it's not gonna move. The mobile phase is the water, it is. And that water is over time slowly gonna soak up the paper. 
Now, in this example, the analyst has laid out a series of chemicals on the paper. They've spotted them onto the bottom of the paper. We have two mixtures of chemicals, which could be your samples, and then three individual inks also laid on the paper. And what will happen is over time, these mixtures will get picked up by the water as it soaks up the paper and will be separated out. Some of the inks in the mixtures that had a greater affinity to the mobile phase, the one that moves, will move up the paper more quickly. And the ones that had less of an affinity to the mobile phase and more of an affinity to the stationary phase that doesn't move will move more slowly. So in this example, you can see that the two mixtures of inks were actually blends of different colors of inks and they've moved up the paper at different rates. So I can see my inks one, two and three, which we'll call blue, yellow and red. Mixture one was actually a mixture of red and yellow ink and mixture two was a mixture of red and blue. Now, the important thing here is not to identify them by their colors, but by how much they moved up the stationary phase in the same period of time. So I can see that the red ink always had the same time or the same height of the paper as did the yellow and the blue. And those distances help me prove that mix one was a mixture of inks two and three, etc. There are lots of different forms of chromatography and they all have that same principle of measuring how far things move based on their affinity to the mobile and the stationary phase. You've just seen paper chromatography. You may have also in school come across thin layer chromatography. Same principle, but this time we usually have a thin layer of silica on a glass plate. That's your stationary phase. And the liquid which soaks up it is usually some kind of solvent, but it would be some kind of fluid. And the same principle applies. The idea is that if we get our chromatography optimal, your mixture of chemicals will all space out nicely along the stationary phase and we can identify which one is which. In addition, there are other types of chromatography. There is liquid chromatography. There's iron chromatography, and the one we're interested in today, of course, is gas chromatography. And if you'll uh, excuse a slight plug, Shamaj do offer all forms of equipment to do these different kinds of techniques. Moving on now to the focus of this presentation, what is gas chromatography? Well, gas chromatography is a technique performed using a gas chromatograph by a chromatographer to generate a chromatogram. Let me explain it in a bit more detail. Gas chromatography is following the very same principles we've just discussed. There are stationary and mobile phase, but in this example, things are a bit different. So your stationary phase now is not a piece of paper or a silica gel. It is a viscous liquid or a solid, and it is coated on the inside of a long, thin, hollow tube that we call a column. A good example would be if you imagine a long hose pipe and you coat the inside of that hose pipe with a jam like substance, that's kind of what a GC column is like. And that substance on the inside is your stationary phase that the sample will interact with as it moves down the column. It'll be pushed down the column by a mobile phase just as before. But in this example, the mobile phase isn't a liquid, it's a gas. This is actually where the term gas chromatography comes from because our mobile phase is now a gas. In a very simple system, we take a liquid sample, we heat that sample to cause it to vaporize to a gas vapor, and then using our mobile phase, what we call a carrier gas, we carry the sample down the column, down our jam coated hose pipe, if you will, and your sample is then interacting with the stationary phase on the inside of the column. And hopefully by the end of the column, your chemicals have now separated out and they are detected by some form of detector to produce the chromatogram. Here's the same example, but in a bit more detail. So we have a section there of our column. We have a mixture of chemicals, our sample coming in the start. And as the carrier gas, the mobile phase, pushes the sample down the column, it starts to separate. In many GCs, the carrier gas that we use is helium, as in this example. And you can see over several minutes, the chemicals start to separate out. And by the end of it, 
we now have a chromatogram. This is where the different chemicals are being detected by some kind of detector at the end of the column. Note that because the blue chemical was moving down the column more quickly, because it had a better affinity to the mobile phase, it eluted from the column first, and so the peak for blue, B, we see first. So this is what a chromatogram would look like on a modern system. You get a graph. We have a baseline reading there. That flat baseline is the baseline detection from the detector at the end of the column. And every time a chemical eloops from the end of the column and hits the detector, we get a signal. And this is registered as a peak. The more samples there, the bigger peak we get. And the later the chemical eloops, the later on the peak is in the chromatogram, further towards the right of the chromatogram. And this is very important. When your sample is injected, that is time zero, and when one of the chemicals in your sample eloops at the end of the column, that is when you get a peak. That is retention time, and that is how long it was retained within the column. And this is the fundamental concept of all chromatography. A given chemical should, in theory, always a loot at the same time from the end of the column, with compounds that move more slowly through the column eluting later. So we can use chromatography to look at a peak, say for example at 4.6 minutes here, and we can determine that any peak at 4.6 minutes is in fact chemical X. So what we find is that gas chromatography is incredibly useful. There are literally thousands of applications out there analyzing a host of different chemical groups and mixers. Having said that, it's not the ultimate form of chromatography, and there are some cases where GC might not be appropriate. We also use techniques like liquid chromatography and iron chromatography and spectroscopy techniques in order to analyze lots of different types of chemicals. To give you an idea of when GC is appropriate, typically speaking, GC is suitable for analyzing molecules with low molecular weight and relatively low polarity. In other words, we're looking for molecules that are not too big and have a low boiling point. The reason for this is that in order to use GC, we have to vaporize our sample. It has to be turned from a liquid into a gas vapor to put it down the GC column. So a large molecule or group of molecules that have high boiling points might not be suitable by GC. We also generally prefer molecules that are not too polar and very large molecules with high polarity, things like hormones like testosterone, certain pharmaceutical products, these might not be suitable to be analyzed by GC. In these cases, generally speaking, liquid chromatography is a much better technique. Having said that, just because a compound is not ideal for GC doesn't mean we can't do something to allow it to be analyzed by a gas chromatograph. There are various techniques you can see here, like pyrolysis, derivatization, and thermochemolysis, and these, without going into too much detail, are processes that allow us to convert molecules into a form that allows us to analyze them by GC. Now, if you're sat here listening to this presentation, you likely operate a GC, or at least in close proximity to one, and it's also quite likely you work in one of these industries, and these are the places where GCs are used the most and where we find typical applications. First and foremost, there's the oil, gas, and chemical industry. There's a huge range of applications here, processing chemicals, looking at petroleum, refineries, all these kind of industries use GCs very heavily to analyze their products. Also in the environmental testing region, looking at the environment at different pollutants and making sure we keep our environment clean. A lot of this testing is done by GC again. Toxicology, both in hospitals and with the police force, these are often analyzed using GC and LC. The food and beverage industry is huge, and again, much like environmental, analyzing for pesticides and contaminants, anything that could cause harm to human health is typically analyzed by GC. Pharmaceuticals is a massive industry. It is heavily populated by liquid chromatography. However, there are some key applications looking at the residual solvents in pharmaceutical products that require a GC to analyze. And last but not least, any product you have, uh, whether it be a cleaning product, 
a cosmetic, a fragrance, a perfume, you can almost guarantee that any of these products were quality control tested using a gas chromatograph. So it's worth taking a look at the hardware involved in a GC so you can see what a modern GC would actually look like and so you can easily identify the different parts. We've mentioned in previous slides that a GC requires a source of carrier gas. Now typically this is from a cylinder, it will be in your laboratory or in a gas cage outside and that will pipe your carrier gas into the building and into the GC. As it reaches the GC, it will reach some kind of step down regulator. This will be a flow controller that steps the flow down to a smaller, more manageable flow to run through the GC column. The GC itself is essentially a metal box. It's not dissimilar to a fan assisted oven. And as your carrier gas comes in, it will meet the injection ports. This is a gate, if you will, that allows the carrier gas to flow through and flow into the column but also allows us to inject a liquid sample when required. The oven itself is thermically controlled. As I said, it's basically a fan assisted oven and this keeps your GC column nice and hot. Your sample, vaporized, will then move through the column and will finally reach a detector. Now we won't go into the detector in too much detail just yet, but needless to say that then produces a signal, which is your final chromatogram. So here's what a modern GC would actually look like. As you can see inside the GC oven, we can see our column or columns in this case. The GC is typically controlled by a keypad or some kind of display on the front, although many now are controlled by a PC remotely. The sample injection inlet and the GC detectors are usually in the roof of the GC. And the carrier gas controller, that is the step down flow controller, is typically located in the back of the GC. Speaking of carrier gases, one of the most important decisions you'll make when operating your GC and when developing new methods is how to use your carrier gas and which choice of gas. As a general rule, there are some things that we require from a carrier gas. So it must be inert, extremely pure and completely dry. That is to say that your gas should be an inert gas that does not react with your sample in any way. It should be pure and free from contaminants and certainly free from moisture. The reason for this is that if there are any contaminants within your sample, these will then be detected by the detector and they could have an adverse effect on your chromatography and maybe lower the sensitivity of the system. Generally speaking, we use helium as a carrier gas for GC, although hydrogen and nitrogen are now more popular due to their availability and low cost. For your carrier gas, you do want it to be pure. Typically, we would say a purity of five nines, that's 99.999% or above. In some cases where you're doing very high sensitivity work or working with a GC mass spec, we might say that six nines is preferable. And lastly, of course, the gas must be pressurized. So your gas cylinder will need to outlet the gas at somewhere between five and 900 kilopascals using a regulator. Now, the way in which we use a carrier gas and how we pass it through the GC and the GC column is quite complex. There are a variety of gases we can choose and there are different speeds and pressures we can pass them through the column. One of the ways to assess this is to look at something called a Van Diemte plot. Now, if this looks a bit weird or overwhelming, don't worry, I felt the same way when I first saw it. There are a few take home points you need to remember. What we're looking at here is a graph of two properties. The average linear velocity, that is the speed at which you're pushing your gas through the column, and something called height equivalent to theoretical plates. Now don't worry about that last one too much. Essentially, it's a measure of separation or resolution. And in this case, a lower value of HETP is better and gives us better resolution and more separation between our peaks. Now what we find is using different carrier gases, they operate differently at different speeds. If you look at the first example of nitrogen, that gas gives the best resolution, the best separation between our peaks at a value of about 11 or 12 centimeters a second. If we run the gas faster or slower through the column, we get poorer resolution. The same is true of helium. 
However, the optimum resolution for that gas is faster, around 22 centimetres a second. And finally, with hydrogen, we find this gives resolution not quite as good as nitrogen, but it gives it a much faster speed, now at 40 centimetres a second. So by looking at this graph, we can determine what the best speed would be depending on the gas we've used. Now each gas has pros and cons, it's not just about resolution and speed, there are other factors to consider as well. Hydrogen, for example, gave the fastest resolution in the graph we just saw. However, resolution it gives is only acceptable compared to other gases. On the downside, hydrogen is flammable. Not everybody is happy to have a flammable gas in the laboratory. And hydrogen is not completely inert, and it could react with some of the compounds in our sample. Helium, on the other hand, is very safe, non-flammable, and gives good resolution. It is, however, quite expensive and a non-renewable resource. Finally, nitrogen is cheap and very easily available, and it gives excellent resolution, the best of the three we've seen. However, it's also the slowest and gives us long sample run times and will make us produce a slower method. So that brings us to the end of this first section of the GC course. I hope you found it interesting and informative. To give you a summary of what we've covered so far, gas chromatography is a common technique for analyzing mixtures of volatile and semi-volatile compounds. It's suitable for analyzing light organics but is not suitable for heavier compounds, metals or salts. It separates using two phases, a mobile phase, which is a gas, and a stationary phase, which is coated on the inside of the column. A GC system comprises of the following parts. A high purity gas, your mobile phase for passing through the column. An injector or inlet to introduce the sample and the gas into the column. The column itself for separating out the various chemicals an oven to house the column and keep the system heated, a detector at the end of the column to analyze the samples that are looped from the column, and a data system to analyze the data that comes from your GC detector. The mobile phase is a high purity carrier gas, typically helium, hydrogen or nitrogen, which is used to pass the samples through the column. The stationary phase is a viscous liquid or solid component coated on the inside of that column. If you found this session interesting or informative, please do join us next time. Part two of the course will be on GC column chemistry. We'll be looking at the different types of GC columns, the different column dimensions and their relevance, column phase and polarity, and the temperature ranges that various columns work at. You can find us on all the usual social media platforms. Please feel free to contact us should you wish to find out more. That's all from me. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Excellence in science. Shimazu.